Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on philosophy, French, structuralism and post-structuralism, and specifically Foucault. Michel Foucault. Not Michael, but Michel Foucault. That is a guy from France who lived from 1926 to 1984. Oddly enough, because he has the panopticon, the tower that watches everybody, the fact that he died in 84, which is when I was alive, in fact, uh, was actually, unlike the teenagers, is uh, kind of appropriate given 1984 and Orwell. Uh, Foucault is today a very centrally celebrated and popular thinker particularly in academics and also some left-wing circles. He is considered sort of a post-Marxist thinker, which means he is a French thinker who is plenty, has gone through plenty of Marxism and then isn't not into it, but thinks that new, different, usually multivalent, like Gramsci, multiple uh, plurality has to happen more rather than monolithic one particular system or thing. He is cited thus a lot across political, uh, social, and also academic circles. He's a popular name. There was a, I'm not sure if it still exists, but there was a Brooklyn hipster bookstore called Mother Foucault uh, in Brooklyn. Ha ha. So I saw a photo of that years ago. I'm not sure, again, uh, what the status of the bookstore is today. But that is very hipster, uh, academic, funny. The, uh, he is a study thinker in philosophy as well as history, sociology, and political theory. A lot of these French thinkers are anthropological and all about the social and how we're all very tribal, including the structuralist at the structuralist lunch party, which does include Foucault. He is one of the thinkers who's often lumped together with both the structuralists and the post-structuralists. And honestly, that is because a lot of Levi Strauss's structuralism quickly gave way to things are more flexible than that. And so structuralism, post-structuralism is actually overlapping very much at the lunch party. Levi Strauss is strictly a structuralist and he remains so I, I in terms of and then the other three at the lunch party, we have covered Bart, we covered Lacan, and we are now covering Foucault. Bart and Foucault are the ones who most go Nietzsche-wise. Well, it's not really a clear set system or structure. And so both Bart and Foucault wander from the structuralist lunch party a bit away into being post-structuralists, which are technically not post-modernists, but very close and pre-runners, just like existentialism leads to structuralism, post-structuralism, post-modernism. Post-structuralism is leading away from structuralism, which was anti-existentialism, to something more existential like post-modernism, which is, in a certain sense, balancing a bit of existentialism. You are completely free, and this is all quite meaningless and absurd, and we're free to create meaning. And then structuralism, well, the system is already determined and set before you get there, so you're largely the meanings that you can do counterculturally are set in stone and at hot topic or what have you. So with all of that, and I like to say, you know, if you want to be really countercultural, you can buy REI gear and hike up a very well-defined trail. We'll talk more about that example and things, as I like to say, hiking in the Berkeley town. I do own a bit of REI gear. Um, it's, a, it's a sporting uh, clothing outlet that's hip. The uh, And for hikers and campers especially, and from the Bay. I used to play as a tiny kid in Berkeley in the tents in the REI store. Uh, as a kid, again, a bit of hide-and-seek in the tents um, back in the day. That was after lunch, uh, and that's what I knew. I didn't know there was a university in this town. I knew there was an REI, and I could uh, hide in the tents. I did not know what philosophy entirely was at that time, nor Berkeley. But... You, uh, Foucault actually taught um, at Berkeley. He taught psychology, philosophy, and history of thought. I actually am a bit indebted to Foucault. He is not my favorite, favorite thinker. I do think he is a pretty decent heavyweight French Nietzschean who is worth consideration and study, certainly. I very highly recommend, and I've had more than one student say they really want to learn Foucault, and I tell them, make sure and get a bit of Nietzsche and Heidegger, and then you can have your Foucault. And yeah, they definitely appreciate that advice, and I highly recommend having the basics of Nietzsche and Heidegger the Germans, before you understand Foucault, because Foucault did say that he was essentially a Nietzschean and a Heideggerian, in fact, he did confess rarely, apparently, at least once or twice, that he is essentially a Heideggerian, which means he's a Nietzschean who is looking at uh, things as psychology. 
He, uh, which is more kind of Heidegger-ish, as I already talked about and misspoke with. So, uh, Foucault taught history of thought, and I really like the term history of thought, and I do borrow that. It's interchangeable with philosophy for me to be broad about history of religion, science, philosophy, thought, history of thought. Sometimes it's called intellectual history in history departments. Although here, thought is a nicer, broader uh, word than intellectual, which kind of implies a higher caste and class, which already happens enough in intellectual matters. So matters of thought makes it a bit broader and cultural, incorporating more people in a culture. So history of thought, and he taught that in France, Tunisia, which is North Africa, which uh, like Derrida grew up in North Africa and was Jewish and white, that some of these folks are spending time in North Africa, which is another Vietnam-era kind of area right across the Med from France, where younger folks who are countercultural do not like what France is doing. I just covered Bart and the African boy saluting the flag. That would be actually not North North Africa, probably more uh, Southern Africa. And the boy is then is, uh, or uh, possibly Algerian. Anyway, the point being is that again, whether it's North or Southern Africa, again, or what have you on the continent, the uh, Foucault, it, Bart and Foucault are critical of what France is doing in Africa and with African nations and states. So uh, as colonial practice, so his, uh, Foucault's books are critical historical studies of social institutions and practices such as prisons, psychiatric hospitals, science, and famously sexuality. Foucault argues that we tend to privilege what is labeled as good while marginalizing and dominating what is labeled as evil. And this has become far more pervasive throughout our lives in modern scientific times. So very much a Nietzschean, as we'll talk about here when we crack into Foucault's life story very briefly here. Foucault read and loved Nietzsche. He was already a psychiatrist, I believe, and he read Nietzsche and he fell very much in love with Nietzsche's thought. And so what Foucault does as a French Nietzschean, like Bataille is an early French Nietzschean who takes Nietzsche in interesting different ways, because as Nietzsche says, he doesn't want people to just be a Nietzschean. He needs you to do your own thinking and take it in different ways. What Foucault does as a, a very analytic-minded uh, psychiatrist is he does what he calls archaeology of knowledge. He goes and he picks through the records to find rare cases that are telling as outerlying examples that kind of prove the rule. And he says, look at how weird this is and how that shows you that power is shifting as far as what people think is good or bad in life. And then we can watch the shift. Nietzsche was very concerned, as I already talked about with Bataille. And Foucault is one of the thinkers who's, who's more famous than Bataille, who is very into Bataille, who is carrying Bataille's thought himself forward as a French Nietzschean. That what is happening is, for I did mention with Bataille, children used to play in the shadow of the cathedral, now they play in the shadow of the smokestack. There is a very big anthropological social emphasis in Nietzsche and French Nietzscheans on ancient times are shifting to modern times. This isn't good or bad, but it's a lot more. I often tell people, it's not good, it's not bad, as I said with the Nietzsche title, but wait, there's more. It's not good. Modern times are not good or bad. They're more of what humanity has done. So when people say, oh, we've ditched ancient times or religion, that's good. No, we're going to be even more like polytheism, monotheism than ever before in the name of secular rationalism and then modern times. is what Nietzsche very much says in many ways. Thinkers who like Nietzsche tend to say that, like Bataille, which is the smokestack uh, after the cathedral for the children who sort of grow up in a sci-fi way playing in horror knowing these are the giant institutions in our lives that tower above us. So even if we switch religion out in our lives for pure science or what have you, even if we did, or we went hardcore communist or something like that, it would still be monolithic human piles that are doing power and agriculture and war. So effectively, you don't really trade out. What, what Foucault is thus doing with Nietzsche's thought is he is showing how religious France shifted over to more modern scientific France and as a psychiatrist who was also uh, gay, but at a time when you could not be so open entirely legally about that, either in America when he was teaching in Berkeley Town or in France. And I don't know the specifics of the law, but I do know that enough. In 84, it certainly was a different thing to be gay in Berkeley, etc. 
that with all of that, Foucault thinks that we are going from ancient crazy to more modern crazy, and wow, get a load of this, and that's very Nietzsche. I like that attitude. As a person from hippie land, who's not entirely a hippie, I like that attitude that everything is human, and that science is human all too human, and so was religion. So what Foucault does is he cre he writes books that are somewhat hard to read, but if you know ahead of time that what he's doing is showing how modern times have turned humanity into a new, very all too human, strange bunch of shifting around, what he's doing is not moralizing or prescribing as much as he's just describing. It does make him like Wittgenstein, although they write very differently, where Wittgenstein says the job of philosophy is not to be prescriptive, it's to be descriptive. You're just telling people how culture is and how we use language and how we use thought and feel about things. You're not telling them they should feel these ways. You're like, people clearly do. I like that as well. You will necessarily be forcing your interpretation with all of these thinkers on things somewhat, but at least you are simply showing people the lay of the land and letting them make their choices and do and not doing their thinking for them, as Wittgenstein says. So Foucault is saying, wow, look at the weird ways France shifted into modern scientific times. Doesn't that make us all weirdly fascists in a new way, unlike the Catholic Church during the Inquisition? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, yes, is that with the French, especially not the French, because it's Spanish and it's over already for several hundred years. So heck, the, uh, sadly, so is Monty Python, you know, but with all of that, Foucault is showing how one of the famous moments of pun uh, discipline and punishment is he says, and it's a very brilliant thing to think, and it's a very good idea for introducing Foucault. Foucault, in one of his first major works, Discipline and Punishment, describes in painful detail how a guy who attempted to kill the king attempted regicide. As I do, I always love the Simpsons joke where Bart Simpson picks up the phone and says, you have reached the police emergency hotline. If you know the name of the felony being committed, press one. To select from a list of felonies, stay on the line. And he mashes the buttons frantically because there's a crime, you know, happening. And says, you have selected regicide. If you know the name of the king or queen being murdered, press one. And of course, yeah, and he hangs up in frustration like, dang it. So the guy who attempted to commit regicide, which is killing the king, they tarred and feathered and tortured him in front of everybody and they strung him up, you know, and, and did horrible things to him to be like, don't be this guy. And Foucault does a very good and interesting job. One of the central thoughts of Foucault is that they turned tar and feathering to locking people down, sedating them, keeping them out of the public eye. This is the they of Heidegger. It's just all of us and our cultures. Yes, it's not a conspiracy that knows simply what it's doing. It's open and close to its own understandings of itself as people and as reality, as our mind, life, etc. So you see a moment, it's very interesting, where people used to be held up. The more older way of doing things is hold up an example, brutally do violence to them and say, let's not do that, kids. And all the kids would watch, you know, and, and everybody would, you know, it, you know, and with all of that, that happened very often in many societies, including European ones, where there's no pretending here, one's a decent culture in some part of the world and not or not so simply that we turned it into now serial killers get sort of sedated, they get put on trial in an orange suit, they don't get to talk much, they don't let you rant and rave about your purposes with the devil, you know, the uh, and they probably wouldn't let you or gag you, you know, in back in the day, so you didn't spout, you know, devil worship at people. But notice the difference in power and control strategies. What Foucault is trying to say is not that it's good or bad, and in fact, something in Nietzsche definitely is like, why don't we start punching people more in the face, and Bataille says the Aztecs are the most honest civilization, because they haul one person at a time up the pyramid, so they, uh, they are honest about death and experiencing death more than most of us, and he says it is a positive thing, whether or not we like that at all, or Bataille. That essentially we used to, in France, he goes through a painful description of in like the late 16, early 1700s, I forget the date exactly, I probably have it in these notes. This particular guy had these things done to him, isn't that crazy? And everybody watched, and now isn't it so different in the 70s, is what he writes, and he's right. And it's very Nietzsche, because what he is saying is modern times are kind of neutering and taming all of us, such that we're glad it's not moralizing, it's not being prescriptive, because he's not saying, let's go back to tarring and feathering and torturing people up in front of people. That's horrifying. America has a long, tortured history with public lynchings and punishments and public, you know, all of that in order to horrify people, set examples. Yeah, it takes us into all kinds of issues with colonialism, racism, and other things. 
But isn't it interesting that we all definitely, in being human beings, have urges to make a public example of this or that fool, you know, in good ways at best. And then also we lie, we want to lock it. Okay, let's just have the crazy people be quiet. We never really see them. Foucault does another, jo- uh, one of the parallel moments of this in his History of Madness. Um, he bas- Which he says madness defines what isn't reason, you know, so then you get to be reasonable because you're not crazy, which is what he is saying here. If you are the evil, then you get punished and therefore I'm legal and I'm good because that's the evil over there. Very much like Bart says, the wrestlers get to display good and evil for everyone. We put the criminal on trial. We say there's the evil over there. Scarface, famously, famously Scarface. My quick impression of an Italian doing an impression of a Cuban. You need me. You know, you need me to be the bad guy. As Ice Cube long ago on a tape I owned as a teen said, say goodnight to the bad guy. Is what he says, or say hi to the bad guy. Because basically that's a scene from Scarface where he's like, say goodnight to the bad guy to the whole restaurant in Miami. It's like, you need me because someone is going to be me. You know, you are all liars. And like, yeah. Is again, quick impression, Italian, Cuban, what have you, not sure. The, all of that, of course, jokingly, is very postmodern, actually, uh, of a film, um, Scarface, it's, and the rehashing of the plot, very Agamemnon, etc., with the tragic, uh, tragic pride and fall, um, thus is that Scarface definitely is a more public old school, like, no, you make a public right in the street of somebody, and that's in the modern, no, oh, but we do it, we handle it with lawyers, you know, or PR. Like, that's a very different modern world. And Foucault is not moralizing as much as he's saying, well, who's the real monster? Who's the real savage? And of course, the question is left open and not conclusively answered, but that's awesome. That's what he is specifically doing. We are shifting in the ways we're human. That's not good or bad. It's, in a sense, I like to say now, he doesn't say, but I like to say it's more. Because it's not neither good nor ma- bad. And in fact, there is a bunch snowballing and accelerating although not so simply or completely. But in all of that, there's a lot more as we develop. It's not that civilization is simply after the Catholic Church become good or bad. Here again, the Catholic Church wasn't trying to simply be good or bad in the Middle Ages for everyone. And they didn't simply do good or bad in the Middle Ages to everyone in France. So given after the French Revolution, they removed the 10% of France that was Catholic property of the Catholic Church, gave that back to the people, I guess, unless there's, well, I guess they're setting Ubers on fire or not. But with all of that, of course, essentially, Foucault is saying that uh, there used to be in history, in his history of madness, I got off track. He says that there used to be the Ship of Fools, or the Madhouse Bedlam, I think it was, is the lower class British way of pronouncing Bethlehem Hospital, is Bedlam. You may have heard Bedlam as in insanity. It's a way of pronouncing Bethlehem, Bethlehem, um, in a lower class uh, British accent, I believe. Because, a Londoner, because I think it was one of the horrifying uh, insane asylums for lower class people, public of, uh, I think it, well, it's Britain, I'm not sure if it's the London area. But historically, of course, all that's changed uh, plenty, I hope, because they let people just wander in, especially rich people, and look at the crazy people and kind of gawk like it was a zoo. What Foucault says is they used to let people, everybody gawk at the village idiot and everything, and it was a zoo. Now it's all taken care of and quiet. And again, what it's definitely suggested here, although it's not moralizing, like Nietzsche, Foucault suggests we're cowards. We're kind of cowards covering things up. Not that we should go back to setting people on fire in public or anything, but that we're kind of cowards who would prefer to sedate the criminal and just not pay much attention to it. He is suggesting it's not good or bad, but that's the way that we're shifting around in society. That is very interesting food for thought. That is one of the reasons why Foucault is very hip. That actually covers sort of the central points of some of his of his history of punishment and history of uh, insanity. And he is very famous for both of those works. He is also very famous for his later work on three-part work, which was never fully completed to his liking of his uh, history of sexuality, was in progress when he died. Probably of... HIV AIDS, I would imagine, I hope I'm not slandering any, anyone or anybody or any, or him, but definitely as a Bay Aryan, again, Bay Aryan nation, uh, not the Aryan nation, that's totally different, is that with the Bay out here and with Foucault and the folks, you know, in Castro and Oakland and all the folk out here and much love to everyone. It does seem like Foucault was a indeed a gay man. He did think sadomasochism and people playing with punishment and discipline and violence sexually was an interesting way of being adults and screwing around, and he seemed to be a bit partial to it, but we don't know how much he ever did that. 
He possibly also grew a uh, pot in a window box garden when he was teaching at Berkeley. Uh, but he most, and a lot of French folks want to come out to California or did in the 70s and 80s and be out here and see what's going on. Did. Anyway, plenty. The hipper later French thinkers, Derrida and others, taught in the UC system out here in the universities of California. So actually, again, I'm a bit of a proud alum of the UC system, and so yes. Foucault was probably a gay man who did possibly contract HIV AIDS and then died of the complications of that in 84, which actually 82, 83, 84 was the unfortunate time when a lot of that was going on and people have been discussing, you know, AIDS, Reagan, other things in the wake of what's going on today and let's leave all the politics right there. So let's get to Foucault here. I have been a ranting, and that's easy, with Foucault and Nietzsche, because they're both very uh, interesting and uh, rant-enabled thinkers. Foucault's father was a brilliant but domineering surgeon who once took his frightened son to watch a human leg amputation. Think about later how he's dis talking about public humiliation of the criminal versus private... We're just keeping... I, I, I do mention often some, uh, the, uh, the Japanese uh, guy who claimed to be Jesus and, and the Amida Buddha come at the end of times and did the Tokyo subway attack. The Japanese don't. Uh, the Japanese are super Foucault because they don't tell you when they execute people. I learned this weirdly because I looked up in a source about that guy. I, uh, the library where I also work has sources, has books by that guy. And he's actually like, only Jesus would declare himself to be Jesus. I am Jesus. Like, wow, dude. Well, he not only grew his hair out, A, I'm hoping I'm not like him. He, not only after trying to kill people, then they, it was said a couple of years ago, it's like, he's probably dead. It's like, what do you mean probably dead? And it's like, oh, the Japanese, when you're on death row, don't tell you when they get rid of, like, they don't tell the public. Unlike America, like, and they sometimes have people sit there or not, you know, or what have you is in different states. But in Japan, they don't tell you because they don't want to glorify it. It's like the parking lot, you know, where the bunker where Hitler shot himself is. It's like they don't want to set a gravestone. You know, they don't want anybody sort of glorifying it at all or imitating anything or something. So they're trying to strike it, you know what I mean, a little bit from history almost. So that's Super Foucault. Not only do you not publicly torture the person, you lock them down, sedate them, uh, just plenty of sort of passive torture, what have you, but then you don't tell anybody when you off them, if you choose to off them rather than lock them down forever out of public sight. It, logging them forever out of public sight would actually be even more, in a certain sense, Foucault, because you don't even kill them then, you just keep them forever completely disabled, in a certain sense. Very modern, very clinical, very much a more modern, sterilized, scientific perspective, which is sort of life-killing disinfectant for Nietzsche. And you can see Foucault, who's a psychiatrist who knows being gay is insanity officially in his day in the 80s, as he's experimenting in San Francisco in the scene and teaching out in Berkeley in the Bay out here, which is why he's also super popular in this town. And his thinking lends himself to that. But with all of that, yeah, Foucault, well, yes, he had an interesting life and career with all of that. So, to get back to his life here, and I'm getting off track again, uh, he studied and taught psychiatry before he got into philosophy. He didn't come out here to, to teach psychiatry, essentially. He came out to teach uh, his Nietzschean philosophy, I'm pretty sure. Um, as, and as he studied and taught psychiatry, he had an epiphany in 1953 watching Beckett's play Waiting for Godot. Some call it existential. The play is very existential. Beckett did famously reject the label existentialism, but the work does deal with things that are quite existential, and we could call ourselves Camus or absurdists or whatever. Later that year, uh, Foucault went on vacation in Italy, and he famously brought Nietzsche's Untimely Meditations. That is sadly the book in which I'm pretty sure Nietzsche does go off misogynistically when asked. So here's some, he says, there is no objective truth. Objective truth is silly. By the way, here's some of my objective truth. And then he rants terrible things about women for a while, which Derrida praises as an amazing performance and him bearing his heart for all of us, unfortunately. You know, and it's tragic and that's beautiful for uh, Derrida and other French people. So bringing that a German would bear their heart. Again, like the Aztecs. No, we're going to experience death. You get to die. So Nietzsche's untimely meditations, Foucault brought that with him. And he apparently spent the whole vacation uh, in the hotel room reading Nietzsche because he started reading it and he just could not stop is famously what happened. He was already a grown man, a grown man and a psychiatrist. And he said, I need to get into this. And he effectively became, he remained a psychiatrist as a closeted gay guy, as in, a gay is insane, and he is thinking about what is good or bad or legal or illegal in a culture 
in the most clinical and scientific of things, even, you know, and human desire and prejudice and all of the different ways we are, all overlappingly and sloppy in a Nietzschean ape-like way. But he spent his vacation, which does be, the work Untimely Meditations begins with the, uh, it's four essays, I believe, and it begins with the essay Schopenhauer as Educator. We already had the Schopenhauer. Foucault spent most of his vacation reading Nietzsche on the beach and in the hotel room. Even though some French intellectuals still con teacher, uh, considered Nietzsche to be a proto-Nazi, and thus they were avoiding him even then at the time. Foucault said he no longer felt mentally trapped after these experiences. And in his first major work, Madness and Civilization, in 1961, getting close again to modern times, uh, progressively here in the modern philosophers, he said he would, quote, conduct all of these inquiries under the sun of the great Nietzschean quest, end quote, which is sort of to document how the times change with us and we change and don't change with the times and just freely do that lovingly and crazily. Foucault became fascinated with the complexity of the history of good and evil. Now, notice beyond good and evil of Nietzsche would set us in that direction, although he read Untimely Meditations first. The sane and insane, according to psychiatry, again, homosexuality, is it sanity or insanity, who can tell you entirely and why and what counts as it being natural or not. In, in the history of psychiatry, normal and perverse in the history of sexuality, what gets to be normal sexuality for the Greeks who had, well, uh, if, unfortunately, if you want to, you can check out my talks on this uh, Plato's Symposium as well as the Theotetus, which is yeesh, time as far as Greek sexuality. But all of that, um, for us anyway, the uh, legal and criminal, who gets to be legal and who gets to be criminal, if everybody is, if different classes are stealing and certain classes are prosecuted and others aren't, let's say, then who gets to be legal and who's a criminal in the history of justice in prison, arguing that truth is a struggle. And again, for Nietzsche, everything, the coldest and of scientific truth is a Darwinian ape struggle and passionate, that truth is a struggle between competing forces, institutions, and interpretations. So what this is clearly saying is science is, secular science is somewhat eclipsing religion. And again, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just more humanity would be the Nietzsche and Foucault simple answer here. And I do actually sincerely somewhat believe that. I think you can qualify things this, this way or that, but I do and argue that human beings have been human beings consistently for possibly a well over 100,000 years in many ways, and I can just generally leave that loose and say thus, yes, it is very interesting that then as institutions rise in our lives, religion separates what's the holy or the profane from each other, and then science is, well, this is wrong or bad or unnatural, and then we have the 50s rolling into the 60s, rolling into Foucault's work, etc., so like Bart, Foucault argued that truth is complex and historical. I learned a lot from Hans Sluga in this town. He knew Foucault in this town. I believe hung out with him. And with all of that, uh, he always says that truth is uh, historical and psychological. And I think that Foucault would also say complex, historical, and certainly a psychiatrist uh, would say psychological. Uh, but ideology attempts to mask this by presenting clear exclusive divisions between opposites. We as an ape want clear divisions, like Bart says with the wrestlers. They're all hanging out, Bart and Foucault, with Levi Strauss at the lunch party of the structuralists. So with the four-person lunch party group, which we've been talking through, Human beings want clear good and bad, sane and insane, so they want to go to bedlam or they want at least psychiatrists to have locked down the crazy person and fully say this is a category that applies to them, and then all of that is somewhat in rotation and in progress. Institutions must support. Now, this is, again, a very central, interesting idea of Foucault. He takes Nietzsche, and it, this is very much what Nietzsche thinks already, but he is phrasing it in new French ways. Institutions must support binary divisions to maintain power and pronounce themselves objective holders of genuine knowledge and truth. That means that unless we fake it to make it a bit and overgeneralize the insane, those are the criminals, either by locking them down and sedating them and Japan never telling you when they kill anybody, or burning him on, at the stake and as a witch. She's a witch. Who are you so wise in the ways of ancient sciences? And with all of this, 
if you do not create those binary divisions, you cannot maintain power. Now, one of the upshots of this without getting into it, I am constantly asking people to be critical of simple declarations of objectivity. And I am a pragmatist, which means I like the science is fine, but I don't think that people should be making declarations of one culture as opposed to another having objective truth. As much as you and I can reject or accept any beliefs of any culture we like and we judge them without talking about it uh, quite automatically. So without the feeling the need to accept any beliefs, it is definitely worrisome for Nietzsche, Foucault, and others, and I share this worry, that people are very quick to forget that religion created, well, they're not quick to forget that religion created divisions in people, but people are all too quick to accept that they're secular, rational, scientific people in the 1800s, 1900s, and onwards, yes? And then somehow that's supposed to get us over problems we never get over. That we remain the same ape, and then when secular science kind of kicks religion sideways a little bit and to the side, nothing really simply improves yes with the complexity of that statement being what I know you know it is. Nothing in humanity really simply turned from good to evil or evil to good, and we didn't simply lose or gain morality with religion, and we didn't simply gain or lose logic with science. That's very much what Foucault and Nietzsche are playing with, and Foucault is definitely, as a psychiatrist who has no problem doing very detailed analysis of, of uh, he wants to do detailed history of science in order to show how human it is. That he certainly doesn't have any problem studying science, but he definitely says when what is gay or what is straight and normal is an interpretation that does depend on things in the world, but is a power struggle, if truth is a Nietzschean power struggle, then you can't just have the good scientific model, hooray, it's done. That's not how human truth or science works. And that would be another way of being afraid and being cautious about religion, science, or politics telling you it is the objective truth. Why? Because whenever they would do something like that, and no, I'm not an anti-vaxxer with conspiracy theories, whenever any institutions do something like that, they are maintaining power. They are trying to hold on to power. And we like and dislike that. We like and dislike that. But that's the good and the bad and the complexity of it. If America makes a big deal out of who's legally here and who's not, which is a thing going on right now, that is in a certain sense, and I won't go off on a tangent into the, into the details of that, and I like, you know, talking somewhat about that. That's not my uh, primary what I know the most about, so I will keep quiet about immigration issues somewhat. But given that I have very, uh, well, views about that, etc., I won't get all into right now. If people are creating in and out divisions, this is very Carl Schmidt as well, a uh, German thinker of, I believe, a, I think he was before this in the 50s also at this time. Well, around the time writing this at the same time as Foucault. In Germany, I, I believe, after the in the wake of the Nazis. If there's usually in-out distinctions that are very, very bivalent, that are very black and white. Those are used, for better or worse, to maintain power. We have things in our lives like religion, science, and politics. Those are institutions. They need to maintain power in order to support themselves. They are living organisms. In order to do that, they are going to oversimplify things and declare there to be the scientific or religious or political thing or not. They have to. It's a good thing to keep, just cynically keep that a little in mind, and you don't have to hate anyone. You don't have to hate science or religion at all. I'm not suggesting you do or don't believe in science or religion completely or not. What I am suggesting is human forms of power set up black and white, all or none divisions a little too generally because otherwise they cannot maintain power amongst a bunch of apes and people. That is what Foucault is saying, which is why being gay is declared by psychiatry to be bad sexuality, bad. And then it's like, well, you know, because that is one of the ways Foucault is clearly critical in the wings of his work without saying it directly at the time entirely, but it's pretty much there to find, isn't it? That this is why Foucault is popular as well, because this fits into a lot of issues in people's lives that are certainly of issue right now. Have been since 84 and only gotten more public and personal. On the... both ways. On the... Uh, so the, it, what happens is, and this is very Nietzsche... Institutions must support binary holders of genuine knowledge and truth. Say the experts do know. They know some. And then you get to grad school and in every field, it's like they know pretty much here are the best views. And it's like, but before that in the textbook, they do, you know, it's very much more they do know as undergrad, grad school. Eh, we're kind of figuring this out. And this is the interesting stuff is what we don't know. 
always, but most important in a field. So, uh, which is how the paradigm shifts happen and are needed. Institutions must support binary divisions to maintain power and pronounce themselves objective holders of genuine knowledge and truth. That's shamans, that's scientists, that's priests, that's everyone. This bends our view, that's Egyptian priests, is very Plato's model of the scientific expert. This bends our view of reality, who gets to tell history and how, such that the dominant system, religion, science, politics, anything, schools of art, identify themselves with truth. They get to wordlessly just be that as existing and being what continues. And the messy historical process and evolution of systems of thought is obscured, which is why Foucault does his work of outerlying examples to unearth and ar do archaeology of knowledge and unearth weird counterexamples that show us context, nuance, overgeneralization, the shades of gray between the blacks and white that really shows you history. On one side, giving an institution the right to distinguish the sane from the insane is quite sane and sober. Foucault is not saying let's ban, he is anarchistic, and I'm also an anarchistic person. Usually people would not label themselves full on box, what have yous. But being more anarchistic, and Foucault certainly is, and I do like to say that I am that decently, in that you are resisting, well, let's not have necessarily the fully fixed, now we all have to do it system, after in which is very popular with post-Marxist thought, which is an anti-Marxist, but is, so now let's do something uh, a little different from Marxism, but along something like those things or anything, given Stalin and especially and others, that it's sane to have decently the sane and the insane divided somewhat for us all to have experts to consult and know if we're okay, but on the other hand, when one looks at the complex history of uses and abuses of these categories, you can find much that is outright insanity. My, one of my favorite is Dracula dead and loving it is a terrible, horrible, forgive me, Mel Brooks joke where he has locked, they've locked down the Igor and I know that it's not, uh, Frankenstein apparently doesn't always have an Igor at all, but that's actually also Mel Brooks apparently and young Frankenstein. But in uh, dead and loving it, the Igor ish character is, uh, he is saying is that he is locked down and he's eating bugs and he's Dracula's familiar as a guy, so he's twisted and insane. And the doctor's like, give him an enema. And he's like, no, not another. And he's like, yes, another and another until you come to your senses. I do love Mel Brooks movies. As if that, unfortunately, sorry to give you the image, would make you sane. You know, if you just went through that process repeatedly, it would probably make you, it's highly abusive and terrible. The, of course, uh, and uh, yeah. That essentially, on the one hand, that's a good abuse of insanity. They're clearly making fun of actually sort of the Kellogg thing in that movie and somewhat like old in, uh, practices of sanity and health that are somewhat old-timey 1800s horrifying in the movie on purpose. So are the institutions sane or insane, just or unjust? How can we know so simply? Again, Lisa says, bedad to Homer Simpson, but if you're the police when he forms a vigilante group, but who's going to police the police? And Homer's like, I don't know, Coast Guard? How can we know so simply when these institutions determine their own sanity, their own ability to be good or embody justice and truth? For Foucault, knowledge is always involved with power. I uh, grew up watching a little bit of Schoolhouse Rock, which is hold over from the 70s for me in the 80s. And it was dun 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 dun, knowledge is power. And of course, it's like with Foucault, it's a bit more sinister. Knowledge is power. Be careful. I have a Dilbert comic, which I can quote from back in the day. Dogbert, Dilbert's pet, is talking to Dilbert's co-worker and friend, I believe Wally. He says, remember, knowledge is power. So never tell people anything because they might use it to crush you. Do you understand? And Wally's like, I'm not saying. This is, of course, knowledge is power, meaning it's good, it's bad, it's everything. It's for for code knowledge is not only enabling freedom. It's not making everyone free to be a doctor or anybody. It is at the same time domination and control. Not everybody gets to get through med school or pass. A contradict which, as I like to mention right here, I oftentimes will explain to the students. I'm a very lefty anarchistic person. Do I want to go into a waiting room and have the doctor say, "Hey, who thinks this guy's a strep throat?" Democracy. We all want a bit of authoritarianism in our lives, and Foucault famously said, "We ha we have to fight the fascist." in all of us, which is why he is sitting around and or not watching people in clubs in San Francisco that are highly questionable, even for me, where people are dominating each other in ways uh, straight and gay, etc., because that would be playing with human fascism and power-hungry apes, etc., playing with what they are very much, of course. Whether or not you think that's a smart or crazy idea to do, which I'm not going to shame or judge or what have you is. It's not my thing. 
Again, as the Polish expression goes, not my monkeys, not my circus. But you can see why Foucault would be interested in how people are play acting pain and suffering and domination because that's part of what the ape we are is, is the darker side of the ape, the darker side of the moon and the ape with the monolith. Yet, uh, yes, it all fits together again as their being with French Heideggerianism. So truth is not outside power. It is a thing of the world. That is why institutions are quick to say this is scientific and objective, or this is holy and religious, or this is politically legal. Not just because it's useful, but because it is something where you have to make ape displays to get all the apes in line. It is just part of what we are. We rely on gestures of division to separate the good from the bad, like the wrestlers of Bart, specifically, such as presenting college graduates with formal diplomas. But these divisions create zones of transgression. Now, the transgression is very Bataille speak. There are gray areas where the fertile soil and thinking happens that are not exactly in the box, which is history and the messiness and the psychology and the historical view. There are ways that laws and practices can be violated in revolt. He is thinking counterculture and those clubs. Foucault was fascinated by the work of Dassad and Bataille, two fellow Frenchmen who were obsessed with sexual and violent transgressions as limit experiences, as they are called. Modern protocols governing discourse are used to exercise dangers, much as priests priest once exercised demons. Foucault very much says uh, the psychoanalyst is very much the con Catholic confessor. He makes that comparison very explicitly. Whereas we used to go to church, let's say as French people, if we're Catholic or French or not, and go in there, confess, okay, now you're back integrated into society. Psy uh, Freudian psychoanalysis allows middle and upper class uh, folks to work out their problems and then go back into the terrible pit of you know all of the horror because it allows them to adjust and rework a la confession, a la Catholic confession. So Foucault here, we not only have Bedlam becomes the lockdown out of sight insane asylum. This is a bit like that movie Unsane, in fact, which I did like that movie is very much you get locked down. Nobody gets to talk to you when you're insane, kind of nowadays, dangerously, illegally in plenty of states. It's very much suddenly you disappear when you go insane, as opposed to you're publicly exposed to people in Bedlam. You also thus have here the zones of transgression and limit experiences um, like with the guy being tortured in public, the regicide uh, tempter. Um, and then you also have this with wrestling and we want things to separate this. And notice how wrestling is itself a very entertaining limit experience of a bunch of glorified violence, etc. So in a 1971 interview, Foucault's later interviews are a lot of the place to get some of his best explaining of his long books and thought because he really crystallizes it. And there's a book or two of his interviews, which are really good, of his later interviews in the 80s. But this is an interview actually from 71 earlier. Uh, he says, we must free ourselves from cultural conservatism. That is definitely moralizing and sounds it, as well as from political conservatism. We are must, that definitely tells you what side of politics he's on. We must see our rituals for what they are, completely arbitrary things, completely arbitrary things, quote end quote, which doesn't mean they're right or wrong. They just sort of are the forms of life. It becomes very Wittgensteinian. They're just the forms of life we happen to be living. Maybe we find better, maybe we don't. It is good and it, that is the real theater a bit of Artaud, the surrealist uh, theater director, to transcend them in the manner of play by means of games and irony. That would be Wittgenstein as well. It is good to be dirty and bearded, to have long hair, to look like a girl when one is a boy. This is hippie time. And vice versa. So he's talking about, of course, butch lesbian women. And uh, Judith Butler is, of course, a one who says gender is performance and knows uh, very thoroughly her Foucault. One must put in play, he puts in quote, show up, transform, and reverse the systems which quietly order us about. As far as I am concerned, that is what I try to do in my work, is what he says. Well, what is counterculture not doing here? You know, so in Discipline and Punishment, Foucault contrasts the pre-modern spectacle, I've already mentioned this a bit, of the public execution with the modern prison. The first openly displaying power and passion theatrically, and the second concealing it clinically. 
Think about how much is concealed clinically are a good pair of words in modern society, and you'll understand modern mythology, as Bart says. We have clinical steroids. One of the things I like to point out here, apparently, and don't freak out over hospitals, please, or not go, you know, if you need to, Hopefully you can, but if you sterilize a hospital floor, you have to keep doing that because a sterilized floor is apparently the Wild West for germs, and they just love it, and they cover it. So, actually, funny enough, you'd think sterilizing a floor completely cleans it for a good long time. Actually, if you sterilize, if you, well, maybe you could have a hippie hospital with a dirt floor, and it's like, no, we just let the bacteria go, man. You know, I'm thinking, I'm too much from this town. Is that with all of that, and it's the hipster hospital, what have you, is, you know, with natural, bi uh, I'm guessing, you know, and yes, uh, biotic cultures etc in the soil and you take off your shoes that with all of this and however we're culturing ourselves of course we're be uh, certain things are clinically concealed you know and we're making things modernly mythological via science and the power of gears and computers and entertainment and propaganda through tv channels etc and the internet um that is very modern mythology that comes about scientifically and mechanically and so thus we are very mythological apes and in secular scientific times as we as the french were in catholic times and as people were in monotheistic polytheistic and tribal animistic times this very anthropological view going on i happen to like that view considerably I think it's humbling and i think no matter who we are i think it helps um but that's me and that may not be you so, uh, Nietzsche and Freud both argued that passions cannot be displayed outwardly in action, uh, that act passions, it's a very fluid dynamic model, that cannot be displayed outwardly, turn inward on ourselves. Nietzsche says the man who despises himself still has respect in himself enough to despise himself in one of his quips. We turn on ourselves if we can't turn outward on somebody else at our worst. In all of his work, Foucault argues that our modern cultures of government and science continuously tried to impose Apollinean order on top of our underlying Dionysian longings. You have the reason versus emotion, Nietzsche, early, uh, earliest work here. We have longings for passion and meaning, but we're constantly trying to hem that in back and forth balance with order. And so Desaad and other artists, if Desaad was an artist indeed, show us what Kant and Hegel leave unmentioned in their studies of reason. Nietzsche says, there's been great philosophers who are uh, German and others talked a lot about reason. They don't talk about friendship or sex. What's these guys' problem with knowing actual life? That's a very Foucault thing to observe. Science and the state impose belief in order, but art and philosophy can inspire doubt and transformation. Now, obviously, and I do want to say, science can get people to reason and doubt, can believe in doubt. Art can get people to believe in doubt. It really isn't so one versus the other is belief or doubt. Science is something like the solid practices we can most phys uh, observe that have to do with this or that particular practices of, hum of humanity, and then and observation instruments, etc., which then work together with us to create the forms of knowledge that we have for Foucault. And then we also have things like art, which are more speculative, and we could do them several different ways differently, more so than we might be able to arrange gear systems as best we can think. But with all of this, science and religion and art give us belief and doubt, very Heideggerian, give us belief and take belief away by providing doubt, and things are open and closed symbiotically as self and world. That remains with the transition from religion to modern science. And actually, what we definitely see is religion is not dying in the world. Actually, all of these people definitely did assume religion was somewhat going the way of the dodo. And it actually, because poverty is not in the world, actually religion is thriving. Unfortunately, that does seem to be the case. I don't mean because I don't like religion. I mean, I don't want poverty to thrive. But religion may help out the impoverished more in ways than modern sciences. In ways. And again, I leave that to your discretion to understand. But of course, understand, I do not mean science has been evil versus good. That's just simply not the case for Foucault nor myself, nor Nietzsche. Things are way hairier than all of that and human. So science and the state impose belief in order, but we can then with art, philosophy, or even more science or anything, inspire doubt and transformation. That would be paradigm shift for Thomas Kuhn in the sciences. And, and philosophy and history of science. Foucault repeatedly referred to the institution of subjugated knowledge, the ins I'm sorry, <laughs> that would be different. The insurrection, not institution, of subjugated knowledges and the will not to be governed, which is anarchistic. Sub now, knowledges in the plural. I found some philosophy folk or somebody made the uh in a memeish image not in standard high impact font in the meme type 
And it says, and it's a clearly a self-help line kind of comic that somebody has replaced the text with. And it says, is someone you care about getting involved with post-structuralism? Which would almost always be Foucault, pretty and primarily. Others that we've talked about, but very much studying Foucault. And it says, and it shows a woman on the phone with concern. It says, my son has recently been using the term knowledge in the plural. Should I be worried? It's not just knowledge, it's knowledges that don't all, like, cohere into one set. Think shamans have ways of doing things, and then the corporation will go to Argentina, take their thing, chemically analyze it, and then sometimes try to patent it and keep the shamans from doing, you know, the things that they've patented, I've heard. But with all of that, of course, it's a different sort of knowledge when it's situated in the tribe, let's say, or a different practice than the corporate practice and experience and knowledge. So you could have knowledges in the plural because there's a way of understanding it for the shaman that isn't the modern chemist if you understand my drift. So she's like, my son has been saying knowledge is, what the heck, should I be worried? And the woman in front of the old school computer monitor who has the call thing in her ear says, unfortunately, this might be a symptom of reading Foucault. Refer to, quote, human nature, end quote, in your conversation and observe your son's reaction. Because of course, as you might already figure here, if you said human nature singular to Foucault, who's worried about science prescribing, uh, proscribing outside of legal sex, gay, you know, being gay, clearly human nature set in stone as just one thing is a social construct. There, this is exactly the same sort of folks who created the Batman slapping Robin meme, which was so popular. And it says, but objective reality, and Robin is saying either but objective reality or but human nature. And Batman's like social construct. And he smacks Robin across the face. Please don't smack people too much. We all need a good smack. But again, you know, hopefully that's consensual. Don't go to the wrong clubs, you know, for any of that. That's all I'll say. So Foucault, very famously, again, uh, perhaps your son is, uh, the son would obviously react and be like, human nature, singular, dang it. You know, mom, you're being all square, man. Not like philo uh, bald philosophy, man. Foucault, I am amazed I actually took me this long to say this. Foucault is occasionally referred to on the internet because he is so popular as an actual philosopher in intellectual circles, believe it or not. He is occasionally referred to with his image with sometimes fake quotes that aren't him, obviously, as bald philosophy man. Like, and he is bald philosophy man in glasses. So yes, that is Foucault. You can identify him on the street by sight, or you could. It was the 70s. So Foucault famously uses fame, uh, the image of Bentham's panopticon. Bentham is actually a philosopher I haven't particularly covered just yet in my videos. But the panopticon is an idea that Bentham the British thinker had where he said there's a prison with a tower in the middle designed so that prisoners are always under surveillance by the tower, which apparently has like double paned window uh, glass so you can't see who's in the tower or it's positioned so you can't see the guards. But the guards could, and everybody can see that the guards can see everyone else and everyone can see everyone else arranged around the tower in their cells. That the prisoners are always under surveillance, but the guards are invisible, and suggests our modern cultures are similarly engaged in panopticism, is what Foucault says. Our ability to know and order things more than before has created a situation where some things are on display for all to see, while other things are completely concealed. <coughs> I did actually mention, you know, it's actually worth bringing up. Please don't think me a conspiracy theorist. I mentioned to a friend or two, one did think me a conspiracy theorist. During the Capitol thing that happened in America, again, politics aside without getting political, did you see, now not, and when I said this, people were like, no, the crowd didn't have guns. Yes, they they actually did stop the whole crowd from ever, ha from having any guns um, because they, that, uh, D.C. is a very anti-gun town, apparently, and some guy actually tried to get guns across the Potomac, supposedly, according to the FBI. Not important right now. But the crowd didn't have guns. But did you see the government actually have any long guns? By long guns, I mean anything other than pistols. There were a couple of, you saw a couple of pistols drawn in the footage. Unfortunately, but the, there is probably a line beyond which there is very serious security. We didn't even see it. That's like what the, the African boy soldier, child soldier is saluting off camera in BART in, that, in the last talk. You don't even see like any of the of the very serious security, and obviously all levels of security are serious. But beyond a certain point, it would be top secret, and that would include you never seeing any actual long guns. Now those are probably there. We don't see them, which makes them sort of more almost power. We don't know what it is. That is a kind of almost. It's a. Sl that's just a bit of panopticism, and I'm not saying let's do or not do that. I figure that would be how security would work in a congressional building 
pretty much in many countries, but in a parliament building. But panopticism would very much the, uh, the British are famous for putting security cameras everywhere nowadays. What's up, buddy? Oh, he dropped the statue. Well, actually, the super glue held. <laughs> I was super gluing that statue and had it tied. I guess he knocked that off. Well, that's okay. Again, panopticism. I can watch my cats. Can they see me? Yes, they can. It fails. So, major fail. How you doing, buddy? Tiger. Hey, pal. Yes. Anywho, the, uh, so panopticism, the British are famous for having security cameras everywhere. And people have said the cops now somewhat sit back and watch security cameras remotely. And then they can send in folks in Britain. Somebody, apparently an artist made a giant walking alien puppet and like sent it through a neighborhood and the cops came because of course everybody could kind of see, and you could see in the public cameras, the public can apparently watch some of the security cameras publicly on the internet in Britain. Teenagers are upset that there's security cameras everywhere in Britain and public government security cameras. And an artist actually, uh, apparently in Britain, because of this, responded by taking a bunch of fake security cameras, just like the shells of the security cameras, and put them a bunch on a wall with a bunch of them pointed downwards all together. Absurd amount of security cameras on a brick wall, but some of them up at the top are just kind of pointed randomly in all sorts of directions. So it sort of looks like there's a crowd of security cameras on a wall. Many of them are all focused downward, all concentrated, and some of them are just kind of randomly looking all counterculturally up at the stars or randomly at a bird or something, which is a funny use of... Human perspective symbolized as La Cucaracha. And yes, again, can I see La Cucaracha? No, but La Cucaracha sees you. Yes, needs a hug. The uh, With all of that, um, and my strange jokings, basically it would be in the police's advantage, and this is not simply good or evil, to be watching people and not to be watched. Let's leave all the politics there, right there. So current legal issues with police filming everything, but being opposed to being filmed themselves. As Freud argued, we internalize our parents as the superego. Us moderns, and Foucault is decently Freudian, us moderns have decently post-Freudian, into Freud, but not entirely. Uh, us moderns, as Latour would call our tribe, the secular modern tribe of our mythological beliefs and this and that, have internalized the voices of government and science. Brush your teeth, accepting their helpful surveillance within our own minds and lives. Again, this isn't simply good or bad. Similarly, we have all accepted the universal truth quote, quote, of scientific studies as superior to the personal struggle of the individual. And of course we do in ways, many of us, let's hope, yeesh, but notice the problems all too human that causes is simply the case. I do constantly point out that science is simply not used for the public good, and that if we stop and look at how it is used, we won't say it is simply anything other than all too human, but that is not trying to force people to believe or disbelieve in objective truth, rather giving them the philosophical positions on that. I have here a Foucault meme. There is a famous uh, mangled uh, Japanese subtitles of a Japanese video game in which the evil villain cackles and says, all your base are belong to us, or something along those lines. And there's a picture of bald philosophy man Foucault staring at the camera, and it says, all your subjectivities are belong to discursive regimes of power, and of is spelled UV, because it's silly meme-ish type being playful and childlike. Foucault is concerned discursive regimes of power would be forms of power that are back and forth and moving even though they are stable. Foucault is concerned with showing the structures of power at the capillary level. The way... And with all of that, um, in fact, I'm going to cut this short because I actually do have um, another three paragraphs here about Foucault. I've already got an hour, so I'm going to cut this and then I will give another follow-up talk of Foucault because there's actually some stuff that I would like to take my time talking about, about Foucault, Wilhelm Reich, and the hippies and how necessarily sex is not simply repressed or unrepressed, which I do like to go on about because it's very interesting and I come from hippie land. So sex not just being a good or bad thing, but being very human is an interesting topic that's good for adults and older children to talk about, you know, and be honest about decently. There also is, in 1971 again, like that interview, um, there is a famous debate with Noam Chomsky, which is worth talking about. So given that, let's cut this talk off here. I thought I may very well have more than one talk on Foucault. 
So with the Panopticon and all of that and all your subjective regi discursive regimes of power with your subjectivities and character, let's talk about the capillary level and we will go on next time with more Foucault. So much love, much happiness, many a cat darting around. And I will as always. Uh, well, I hope you're good and you're bad or else you are possibly dead. And I will see you if I do indeed ever see you.